That was just fabulous. And, you know, it would be my hope that all of our students experience what Raymond experienced uh, in his early college, high school. And uh, Raymond, since you are going into education, don't forget JFF. Maybe you uh, might have a good job for you there. <laughs> we have, I have a Machiavellian strategy at JFF. I basically hire a lot of uh, young people that are under 30. And I do that for two reasons. One, they're very disruptive innovators. And two, they're a lot smarter than I am. Well, take me up on the offer. Well, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be here with you. Um, and good morning, everyone. Let me hear a good good morning from morning. 600 people. OK. Um, you know, when we, uh, I am uh, thrilled to be co-hosting this with Tony Habit and his staff from the North Carolina New Schools. Uh, when Tony and I talked about this conference, we thought, oh, this is the perfect time to bring together a group of people that really have been toiling in the fields and working on this um, education reform model and movement that we call early college. And so over the next couple of uh, days, we hope to explore with you all facets of the early college movement, the good, the bad, the ugly, what we've learned, and also where we want to take it and where we think we can bring this very powerful education model, as Raymond talked about, to many more kids across our country, many more districts and communities. So it's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. Um, as Cece noted, uh, I call her the mother of invention of all this, uh, uh, this movement started over a decade ago, and I'd like to take a minute to ask uh, or to recognize some of the other national organizations that have been involved in this and really have been the foot soldiers. I won't name everybody. There's a lot of them. There were 10 unsuspecting intermediaries that started this uh, initiative, but um, I'm going to just recognize Educate Texas. Can I see the Educate Texas team? Woo! We have Knowledge Works and EdWorks, CUNY, yeah. University of Georgia, and many others that really worked very hard to get this movement um, going. So JFF has been involved in many uh, high school uh, reform and college uh, reform initiatives over the last uh, decade. And one thing you learn when you're in my position is that you really have to pick the right partner. You have to find states that are willing to take risks, that are innovative in their approaches to both high school reform and education reform. Um, and for better or for worse, from the vantage point of the North Carolinians in the room, North Carolina has always been top on our list as a, uh, a state that is willing to kind of think about, think out of the box on education reform, think about workforce development and economic development and how they uh, all relate. And um, so for over a decade, I've worked with both Scott and Tony and their great uh, work over the years. And I recently, um, asked, I, about a year ago actually, I took a tour. I asked Alan Goldston, who's the president of US programs for the Gates Foundation, if he would actually take a tour with me, go to North Carolina, and basically take a look at the entire pipeline. Um, how we actually, what good innovation really looks like. And um, I think Alan was a little leery of me at the time, but he did to go, agree to go on this tour de force uh, kind of visit, and we went to, we went all over the place. We went to Central Piedmont Community College, we went to a Siemens facility, a, a state-of-the-art facility in North Carolina, and we also visited a uh, school, it's Anson Early College High School, and um, we had the opportunity there to meet with both parents and uh, students. And you can imagine that the stories that you just heard from Raymond are stories that we heard from those other students with such passion. Um, the principal and the teachers were phenomenal. And one story that really uh, keeps playing in my mind is we had a young woman there who was uh, going on to a four-year college. She had done terrific in uh, uh, high school. She had a, uh, her associate's degree and she was going on to college. But the most kind of poignant moment was when her mother is sitting next to her and basically what her mother said was that my daughter has inspired me so much that I'm going back to school. And the mother 
was going back, got her GED, and she is going on to college. So these strategies and kind of uh, the, the power of mind here and the power of influence and intergenerational poverty is a very big issue. And I, I see this throughout many uh, communities. So I just want to thank uh, uh, the Anson and for Scott and uh, Tony for that great uh, visit. It really opened up our eyes. And I'm hoping, of course, to get Alan Goldston at the Gates Foundation to even invest more in this uh, initiative. So let me, um, I want to move into what I'm going to talk about are three uh, what I consider national challenges um, that the early college movement can uh, contribute to greatly. Uh, before I do this, I want to take a moment to just talk about the early college, uh, where we are, the state of the state of early college. And in one sense, we could all claim right now victory, right? I mean, we have tremendous progress in this room and through your uh, good work. Today, as uh, Raymond said, there are more than 250 early college high schools in 25 states, educating over 100,000 students. There is irrefutable evidence that early colleges work. Now, I, ha I work with a lot of researchers and policy folks at JFF, and they're always under the hood. Michael Webb and others, well, what, we've got to find something here. What's, what's not working? But in fact, they do uh, work, and here are some of the stats. The first thing is that the, our kids are low-income kids. They're mostly kids of color. They come out of uh, poor families. And here are the, here's the data. They graduate at lot, a lot higher rates than their peers, average of 93% compared to 78%. You've got about 78% uh, that go on to post-secondary training. And you've got 23% graduating simultaneously with, a, with their high school diploma and an AA or AS degree. When you think about what that saves for families, it's really phenomenal and the results are truly uh, remarkable. And we know why our schools work. We know that acceleration, not remediation, will engage young people, motivate them, and uh, get them to accomplish uh, really hard, complex uh, work. Completing coursework, college coursework, while in high school is probably the most effective strategy for determining college readiness. And third, this idea of blending secondary and post-secondary education to create these smooth on-ramps to um, post-secondary really helps people get rid of the transition space. We don't lose people as they're moving into uh, college. So then the question is, why not just claim victory? And in many you know, national movements, that's what we do. We either claim success, claim failure, and we, or we move on. In this one, I think we have three very important national issues that are moving and that we can contribute a lot to. And I'm gonna move through them pretty quickly, but I'd like to provide it as a framing of the next few days. The first is really a growing recognition that our nation's long-term economic prosperity is really at risk. You know, the Great Recession it was a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for governors. It's a wake-up call for communities. It's a wake-up call for businesses. And when you, when I go around the country, and I do this a lot, and I go into communities, all sorts, rural, urban, the effect is pretty devastating across the board. And there is, it's true that we are now having a kind of what I would call a slow recovery, but that recovery is really the, the face of the jobs look very different than what they did five years ago or six years ago or seven years ago. When you look at the demand for IT or for biotech or advanced manufacturing, you, the demand for a highly educated and highly skilled workforce is just so clear. It's not that we haven't talked about it before, but it's as you look at what's happened over the last decade, we can't turn around on this and we have to go forward at a fairly rapid rate. You know, there may be, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar, you're, most of you are, with the economists of Holzer and Carnivale and all the labor market economists. They spend a lot of time debating one another. And they spend a lot of time on the margins trying to determine whether or not there's a skill shortage in this country. 
But in fact, if you get into a room with employers, which we just hosted a session with the National Association of Manufacturing, there is no question about the, um, the degree of the skill shortage in this country. The, I mean, just one stat, 63% said that the skill shortage is limiting their ability to grow. And that's a pretty hefty number, and it's backed up by a lot of other uh, NAM studies and others uh, across the country. So the fact that we, uh, that this really was a wake-up call, and the fact that everyone entering the labor force needs a post-secondary credential and uh, college degree beyond high school, early college has a lot to offer. And I want to just point out two things in this arena. One is that as we have developed the early college high school movement, STEM early colleges have become a major part of our portfolio. We have right now about 35% of our early colleges are STEM early colleges. The second uh, kind of big issue that's happening in the field and uh, m within many states in this room is this idea of building art uh, robust career pathways that cross secondary and post-secondary uh, education. If you had told me five years ago that we would have, as an organizing framework of mainstream education, the career pathways aligned with strong economic growth clusters, I would have told you you're smoking something. It's not going to happen in our country. But in fact, it has, and it provides us with a lot of mobility to kind of um, bring the, our, what we know about early colleges and what states are learning about career pathways together to try to think about what would be the next generation of early colleges as we're trying to align more economic uh, education and economic uh, development. The second issue is drivers, really for me, the uh, issue of the Common Core and implementation of the Common Core. Everybody in this room is in the process of trying to implement the Common Core. North Carolina is way ahead of us in that respect. They basically have uh, implemented it and tested it. But the Common Core for me is just one ingredient in what makes a successful early college, what makes a successful experience for a young person. It's not the heart of education. And so if we think about what we need to do for our young people, it is in uh, establishing deep learning, deep ways of uh, interactions and teachers and students learning together. Um, it's not, and it's about really thinking about how we, how kids navigate the social norms of college and the world of work. And it's, so it goes way beyond it for me, the, uh, the value of the early college model in actually implementing the college core. And I'm hoping that more districts and uh, more communities actually use it as a, use the Common Core as a lever uh, to really think about district-wide expansion of early college design so that all of our young people are uh, meeting that very high standard. And the third uh, issue that I want to mention is just the, um, the issue of college completion for what and college affordability. So, you all know a lot of issues are in play on this particular uh, uh, challenge that we face as a country. You've got performance, uh, you've got states testing performance-based funding models. We have proposed gainful employment laws. So people are kind of experimenting with, okay, how do you really make college both more affordable and how do we uh, complete at higher rates? But the thing that I think is going to drive us and where we can uh, grow as a community and learn from our own experience, the enemy is the time of completion for us. So, I'm oh, sorry, time is the enemy of completion. And what we have learned about new education delivery models, competency-based models, online learning, which North Carolina and many other states have experimented with, really are the new approaches that will galvanize us and allow us to think about how we actually complete degrees in a much shorter uh, period of time and yet still have the deep educational learning uh, experiences of early college. So I just want to uh, close with this. With all the OECD studies that are out, uh, 
we have, you know, it's stat after stat about our, where we sit on the uh, economic, international economic spectrum. And, you know, it talks about we're at 14th in post-secondary attainment, we're, uh, and we're losing ground there. It, the latest stat, which was very disturbing, we're third to last on um, uh, post-secondary attainment for poor families in this country. Uh, but what these reports don't talk about, and what I think we're here to talk about in this room, is really the ingenuity, the entrepreneurship, the innovation that you all have developed mind in this field, that we can solve some of the entrenched problems that our country uh, faces. So I look forward to uh, working with all of you over the next uh, two days. I hope we'll get down and dirty on solutions and uh, really explore what the next generation of early college uh, designs and pathways and innovations might look like. Thank you very much. Glad to be here with you, all of you.